Hey Cinephiles, and welcome to the first installment of everything I watched last month. This is a video I've been wanting to try out for a long time now. I've seen a lot of other film YouTubers doing it, and I wanted to put my own spin on it. For the last couple years, I've been sharing my top five first time watches each month over on the Cineflex community tab and inviting you to do the same. I've enjoyed the conversations we've had over there and I wanted to find a way to bring that to one of my videos. It's my hope that we can discuss anything that we've watched and each get plenty of recommendations of what to add to our watch list. The other reason I'm doing this is because every year I see hundreds of films that I never get to talk about here on the channel. This will give me the opportunity to share my thoughts on all sorts of films, big and small, new and old. And not just films, I'm going to talk about any shows or series or comedy specials that I've watched as well. So here's how this is going to work. I'm going to run down my list of everything I watched over the last month in chronological order more or less. Along the way, I'll briefly share my thoughts on each title before giving it a star rating out of 5. After I've covered everything, I will then rank my top 5 first time watches in addition to naming my best rewatch, best show or series, best short film, best comedy special, and finally, the worst movie I watched. Without further ado, here's everything I watched in June 2022. I kicked off the month in the best way possible by attending the special one night encore screening, or maybe I should say encore, of RRR Rise Roar Revolt, a movie I have been raving about since I first saw it in April. This time around, I dragged my wife and a couple of friends to see it, promising them one of the most incredible cinematic experiences of their lives. I'm happy to report that this was an even better theatrical showing than my first time around. There was a solid turnout and we as an audience burst into applause numerous times during the film. RRR might as well stand for radiating rapturous reactions. Now I already have an entire video on RRR so I'll point you in that direction if you want to hear more. Just know that seeing it for a second time on the big screen, truly the way it's meant to be seen, has only solidified my rabid affection. If you were one of the lucky few to still have RRR playing in a theater near you, please, please, please do yourself a favor and check it out. For everyone else, a bit of a good news, bad news, good news situation. While the film is widely available on Netflix, unfortunately that version is neither the original language nor the original format. Fortunately, you can find the original version on the Indian streaming service Z5. Again, this cannot possibly live up to seeing it on the big screen with a big crowd, but I think seeing RRR any way you can is better than not seeing RRR at all. I rewatched The Humans. This was one of my favorite films from 2021, which I gave a lot of recognition to in my Oscar Picks and Snubs video. This is an austere adaptation of the Broadway play with an impeccable ensemble performance. If you haven't seen this, bump it up on your watch list. I've slowly been working my way through the early films Edison Company's playlist on the Library of Congress's YouTube channel, so throughout June I watched a handful of those including Waterfall in the Catskills, Pillow Fight, Seminary Girls, Police Patrol Wagon, A Morning Alarm, American Falls from Above, American Side, Black Diamond Express, Going to the Fire, Mounted Police Charge, The Burning Stable, and A Morning Bath. These are all very literally titled 19th century short films, each under a minute long, that I would argue defy contemporary criticism. Perhaps the first edict of motion pictures was to show the world to the world. These actualities, as the French dubbed them, are essentially the first observational documentaries. While the lack of creativity may do little for us today, I find their sincere efforts to capture a time and a place to be rather precious. And on the extreme other end of the cinematic spectrum and timeline, I've been working my way through volume 3 of Love Death and Robots on Netflix. This month I watched The Very Pulse of the Machine, Mason's Rats, and Kill Team Kill. I've still got a few more to watch so I'll talk about the volume as a whole in another video. Kill Team Kill feels like a pilot episode of a Saturday morning cartoon for immature, mature audiences. I give kudos to Mason's Rats for telling the story of a farmer's war with his barnyard pest from the human perspective, but I think the ending is way too easy. The Very Pulse of the Machine is easily my favorite of these three, a heady sci-fi trip with some stunning visuals and a great lead performance from Mackenzie Davis. I watched both versions of David Cronenberg's Crimes of the Future. The first is his 1970s sophomore feature which I watched on the Criterion channel. This is something of a philosophical sci-fi journal. It's reminiscent of Chris Marker's films and how it was shot silently with commentary added later. It portrays a dystopic world where a plague has wiped out all women. Men wander barren campuses propelled by their attraction to pus, feet, 
and children. Yeah, it's pretty hellish. From an auteur perspective, it's rewarding to see the seeds of Cronenberg's signature brand of body horror and infectious technology were already sprouting over 50 years ago. It's clear here that he is first and foremost an idea man. While there's little on display in 1970s Crimes of the Future to signal the visual nightmares he would go on to create, I still find this to be one of Cronenberg's most nauseating films, and that's saying something. Flash forward to 2022, Cronenberg has made a very loose remake slash sequel also called Crimes of the Future, a title so good that he used it twice. This film is fresh off its premiere at the Cannes Film Festival. I'm for one thankful that Neon rushed this into theaters so that those of us who were having some serious Cannes FOMO could at least see one of the films that were in competition so soon. This time around, Cronenberg has imagined a gnarly future where surgery is the new sex. Surgery is the new sex. Oh. And a subset of organ growth humans appear to be on an evolutionary fast track. This film is rich with ideas and images. While Cronenberg has fleshed out one of his most fascinating worlds to date, the narrative thread stitching all of these body parts together feels rather lax. Viggo Mortensen, Leah Seydoux, and Kristen Stewart are each fun to watch here. It's a shame they all don't get to consummate their tantalizing love triangle together. In any case, here's hoping we don't have to wait another eight years for the next Cronenberg joint. Same one. Pick one. Mark. I also checked out Cronenberg's short film Camera, which you can find right here on YouTube. This is for David Cronenberg what the straight story is for David Lynch, at once wholesome and haunting. The body horror angle is aging itself, the infectious technology is the motion picture camera itself. Watching kids use professional film equipment is like the day for night montage meets Sesame Street. Leslie Carlson gives a masterclass performance. This is now one of my favorite short films. Against my better judgment, I went to the theaters to see Jurassic World Dominion, which I hoped would make good on its promise of dinosaurs roaming our modern world, like stretching the last act of the lost world into an entire film, which sounded like it would be pretty cool and pretty fun. But nope, instead they made a bad sci-fi film about locusts. And they somehow managed to rehash Jurassic Park yet again with shameless homages, convoluted plot lines, and an overloaded ensemble we don't give a damn about. Bigger. Why do they always have to go bigger? That's what she said! <laughs> This franchise has pulled off the inane feat of making each installment worse than the one before. To get the taste of Locust out of my mouth, I watched We're All Going to the World's Fair, which can be described as a coming-of-age horror drama. It incorporates some of the so-called desktop found footage elements popularized by Unfriended and Searching. This one is a very slow burn without any explosive finale, though it has some truly unsettling moments and a rather poignant conclusion that really separates itself from other films of this ilk. I'm still thinking about it, and that's the mark of an effective film. Very strong scripted feature-length debut from writer-director Jane Shobran and actress Anna Cobb. Now, as I said, I'm going to be talking about any shows and series that I watch, but I'll share my thoughts once I've seen all the episodes of a given season, which brings me to season three of Barry. This was already one of the better ongoing shows of the moment, but this season upped its game even higher. Bill Hader, Henry Winkler, Sarah Goldberg, Stephen Root, and Anthony Kerrigan are each superb in this hilariously dark skewering of both the entertainment industry and American crime. The last three episodes in particular are incredible. I already knew Bill Hader was brilliant after his character sketches over the years, his Criterion collaborations, and every episode of Documentary Now, but he has proven himself to be a great storyteller, writing and directing many of this season's standout episodes. Excited for more Barry, and whatever Hader decides to tackle after that. Hands off! What? I watched the first couple episodes of Les Vampires on the Criterion channel. This is the 1915 French silent film serial from Louis Fouillade. I'm watching this for two reasons. One, I've never seen it and it's by all accounts a cinematic classic. And two, in preparation for the new HBO miniseries Irma Vep by Olivia Assayas, a reimagining of his 1996 film of the same name about an actress starring in a remake of Les Vampires. I'll have more to say on all of this in a future video, but I'm really enjoying Les Vampires so far. I checked out Terror Sisters on Mubi, and wow, this film is something else. <laughs> 
Terror Sisters is an all-out assault on transphobia. It's energetic, wildly entertaining, and has a lot to say. I'm excited to check out the rest of filmmaker Alexis Langlois' filmography, and can't wait to see what he makes next. Also, Terror Sisters has possibly the best opening credits since Enter the Void. I've been seeing film horror Twitter rave about The Black Phone for the past year, so I was eagerly anticipating its release. I'm also a fan of writer-director Scott Derrickson, so I'm sorry to say it did not live up to the hype for me. I found this to be a shockingly tame hodgepodge of Stephen King built on try-hard child performances and tiring supernaturalism. Please, please let the dreams be real. I've put The Black Phone last in my ranking of the Derrickson films I've seen. It makes a lot of sense that this was adapted from a Joe Hill short story, as I think this would have made for a much better short film. That said, Ethan Hawke is really good in this, but when is Ethan Hawke ever not really good? Stingla, Jamela. Stingla. <laughs> oh, I guess when he's trying to speak Mandarin. I saw Elvis. My short review, Austin Butler deserves an Oscar, Tom Hanks deserves a Razzie. <laughs> Elvis actually made my most anticipated movies of 2022 list at the beginning of the year, solely because of writer-director Baz Luhrmann, who we haven't seen a new film from since The Great Gatsby nearly a decade ago. I saw that film twice in theaters in 3D because it was just so visually stunning. And that's why I will always turn up to the theater to see whatever the great Boz has been up to. While this movie is chaotic and messy, Austin Butler gives a star-making performance that is really worth seeing. Well, you may go to college. You can read my full review of Elvis over on Letterboxd, where I also have it ranked last in Lerman's filmography. Yes, I still need to see Strictly Ballroom and Australia. And then, it finally happened guys, I popped my Boondock Saints cherry. There was a fire fight! While this was technically my virgin viewing, it was the opposite of going in blind. I know the film's reputation, I've seen several scenes, I know all about writer-director Troy Duffy, I actually watched the documentary overnight a while back before even seeing this film. Still, none of that prepared me for a film that exists at the unthinkable cross-section of Pulp Fiction and The Room. I have so much more to say about this film, and it definitely deserves full cult house treatment. For now, I'll say it's a fascinating and wild ride from beginning to end. Also, it contains an all-time performance from Cineflex patron Saint Willem Dafoe, so of course I was all aboard. Kinda makes me feel like river dancing. I checked out the Norm Macdonald Nothing Special on Netflix. Norm has been one of my favorite comedians for a while. I love his deadpan humor and folksy demeanor. He was working on material for a new stand-up special and recorded a run-through from his home before his battle with leukemia, something he had not made public, took a turn for the worse. Sadly, he was never able to tape that special. Norm passed away last year at the age of 61. Instead, we have this unique video of him running through his entire set. There's no audience, it's just him and two cameras captured in real time. We even hear his dog in the background at one point. It's a very bittersweet watch. His material is hilarious and thought-provoking as always. His delivery absolutely golden, but knowing the end is near gives the entire thing this heavy note of finality. The Nothing Special ends with a round table of Norm's friends, David Letterman, Dave Chappelle, Molly Shannon, Conan O'Brien, Adam Sandler, and David Spade, who have just finished watching the recording. They give their thoughts on his set, share memories, and talk about Norm's unparalleled comedic genius. It all makes for a very fitting tribute. I closed out June with a movie I've been wanting to watch for months now, Petite Maman. This is the latest from French filmmaker Celine Sciamma. Her previous film was Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which I thought was a stone-cold masterpiece. Tough act to follow up, but she's done it with a tender, fantastical drama of a young girl coping with the death of her grandmother. This movie is short, sweet, and beautifully composed. It's very easy to love. I will say, as someone who describes child performances as their kryptonite, because more often than not they take me out of the film, the two girls here feel overly reserved. They're the opposite of the girl in the black phone. Please let the dreams be real. Despite that, I still thought this was a lovely film and highly recommend it to anyone and everyone. Which brings me to the ranking of my top five first time watches in June 2022. Number five, we're all going to the World's Fair. Number four, Crimes of the Future, the 2022 version. Number three, Elvis. Number two, Petite Maman. And number one, the Boondock Saints. Best rewatch, RRR. Best show or series, Barry, season three. Best short film, Camera. 
Best Comedy Special, Norm MacDonald, Nothing Special. And last and least, the worst movie I watched, Jurassic World Dominion. And that's everything I watched in June 2022. What did you watch and what did you make of it? Feel free to share your top five first time watches or everything you watched. Also, let me know what you thought of this video, any suggestions you might have on the format and whether or not you want me to do it again for July. Drop me a line in the comments below. I'll see you down there. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to Cineflect for video essays, film lists, and more. I got this! And click that bell next to the subscribe button if you'd like to be notified anytime I upload a new video. Thank you so much for watching. For Cineflect, I'm J.S. Lewis. Until next time, watch something good.